In today's episode, we hear about a revolutionary pig to human organ transplant. We chat to the researcher that identified the exact DNA that makes us human, and we dig into the future of your morning cup of coffee. But first, it was this week in 1814 that one of the first modern plastic surgeries in the West was performed on a soldier's nose in England using Indian techniques. 207 years later, techniques may have changed, but rhinoplasty is still one of the most popular cosmetic surgeries out there. If you're a child of the 90s, you might remember Mallory Blackman's best-selling novel, Pig Heart Boy. It's a story about 13-year-old Cameron. Cameron's in desperate need of a heart transplant when a pioneering doctor approaches his family with a startling proposal. He can give Cameron a new heart, but it's from a pig. It's quite literally the stuff of fiction. Researchers have long sought to grow organs in pigs that are suitable for transplantation into humans, and now surgeons in New York have done just that. Transplant surgeon Dr. Robert Montgomery, director of NYU Langan's Transplant Institute, conducted the first successful surgery that transplanted a pig's kidney into a brain-dead human. He spoke to USA Today to share his research. We took an um, organ from a genetically engineered pig and we implanted it into a person who had recently died who was being maintained on a ventilator. So this person had been declared brain dead, and the family had decided that they wanted to uh, donate her body to participate in this study. For three days, the new kidney was attached to her blood vessels and maintained outside her body, giving researchers access to it. This marks a scientific breakthrough that could one day provide a huge new supply of organs for severely ill patients. So right now, we're stuck in this paradigm which is that someone has to die in order for someone else to live. Um, What we need is a sustainable, renewable source of organs. And that's what xenotransplantation would provide. There's also um, some really promising um, results for hearts. So I think hearts will probably be one of the first organs that, you know, from um, genetically engineered pigs that'll be transplanted into humans. The success of the surgery is really exciting for many in the medical field, but the research is particularly close to Dr. Montgomery's heart, if you'll excuse the pun. Actually, I I just celebrated on on September 20th, so five days before um, we did this uh, landmark procedure, my third year anniversary of my heart transplant. You know, at a time which is sort of borrowed time, you know, for me. Um, I, I always sort of felt like, um, you know, because I've had many um, near-death experiences prior to the transplant that I was resuscitated from or brought back from, including being in a coma for almost a month. Um, and I always felt there was some reason or purpose that, you know, I, I'm still around. And I don't know, maybe this, maybe this is it. Six. It could soon be time to say goodbye to traditional farming. Between changing climates and the degradation of our soil, as you'll hear a bit later, our ways of farming have to change to meet the lives we live today. At a Silicon Valley startup called Iron Ox, the plan for agriculture is to automate the entire growing process indoors with robots and artificial intelligence. The promise of this type of farming is that it can help humanity grow food with a fraction of the resources traditionally used. At the startup, they claim their system uses 90% less water than a traditional farm and 90% less electricity than vertical farms that use LED lights. At the company's greenhouse, robots are integrated with the hydroponic system that is used to grow herbs and vegetables. A robot named Grover moves pallets of produce around the facility and they're then handed over to Ada, a robotic arm that helps inspect the plant's roots. Speaking with Reuters, Senior VP of Engineering Sarah Ozantoshi says she believes robots like these could help pave the way to a sustainable future. I really believe that we need to 
grow in a way that could feed the future of the world without hurting the earth. So a big part of our mission is to grow more with less. And so we designed these robots to always consider how we could grow with less water and less electricity. So Grover enables us to grow in this modular way in a greenhouse environment using the sun. And then Ada allows us to precisely inspect and understand what's going on. Water usage is increasingly in the spotlight, especially in sunny California. In this greenhouse, any water not used can be pumped back into the system to be used later. The tech company's CEO, Brandon Alexander, said, It's been an eye-opener. I think we're now at a stage where most people understand that conditions are only getting worse. We want to give each plant exactly what it needs and nothing it doesn't. We have these sensors that plug into the module and they check the nitrogen content. They check the uh, potassium and phosphorus and acidity. And then they say, what is missing? What does that plant need that we're not giving it? I think our robots enable indoor growing to become a really scalable, sustainable, and precise business. I think it allows us to grow in a changing environment. And I think it's a really interesting way to bring modern technology in a controlled setting to agriculture. And it lets us do things and grow in ways that are really unique and different. Still to come on the Sunday 7, ancient sword discoveries and the DNA that makes us human. A diver off Israel's coast recently made a remarkable discovery, an ancient sword. An amateur Israeli scuba diver stumbled upon a treasure trove of artifacts near his local beach, including a large sword that experts say likely belonged to a crusader knight some 900 years ago. Yaakov Shavit from the Israel Antiquities Authority told CBS News. And it was amazing, amazing to see a beautiful sword like this. The ancient sword was found near the port city of Haifa by a diver named Shlomi Katzin on a casual swim, and this was no trinket. Actually, it's, it's, it's heavy, okay? It's heavy because of the stones that uh, glue to it, and also because it's iron uh, uh, sword and very big one. Experts are planning to clean and x-ray the barnacle-encrusted weapon in hopes of learning more about its backstory. Maybe there is a name, or written on it, maybe there is a decoration, and that will also give us more uh, information about the knight who holds this beautiful uh, sword. As for its age, authorities said that the location of discovery suggests it could be from the Crusader period between 1095 and 1291. Talk about a deep dive through history. Chimpanzee is humans' closest living relative. About five to six million years ago, our evolutionary path separated, leading to the chimpanzee of today and Homo sapiens, humankind in the 21st century. Now, stem cell researchers at Lund University are trying to find out what exactly is in our DNA that makes human and chimpanzee brains different. So I'm Johan Jakobsson. I'm a professor of neuroscience in Lund. So to study differences between a human and a chimpanzee has classically been done by using the chimpanzee, of course, in, in the lab, but... But that's, I mean, ethically challenging and it's also in many aspects problematic, right? So in this project, instead, we started with stem cells. So the stem cells we, we obtained from, uh, from chimpanzee and it is, it's no harm for the chimpanzee. So the chimpanzee continues to live the life afterwards. But then we can take these uh, stem cells to the lab and compare them to human stem cells. It, it, it provides a new alternative to animal research, which I also think actually provides better results in the end. In these stem cells, the researchers then found that humans and chimpanzees use part of their DNA in different ways, which appears to play a considerable role in the development of our brains. Our genomes is, of course, full of genes, right, which are the building blocks of the cell, which make proteins. But that's only a fraction of our genome, less than 2%, actually. So there is this other kind of big chunk, which is the, the vast by majority of our genome, and that's not so much studied, actually. In this study, we found... Uh, one particular part of the genome, which is very repetitive, is basically a piece of DNA that's repeated many times. And that seems to be, the number of repeats seems to be very important to, to distinguish some aspects of 
human and chimpanzee brain function. The new findings indicate that the difference between us and chimps are in what used to be known as junk DNA, long repetitive chains that were thought to have no function. Previously, researchers have looked for answers in the part of the DNA where the protein-producing genes are, which only makes up about 2% of our entire DNA. But now it looks like the answer to what makes us human could be hidden in the overlooked 98%. It's still early days, but the new findings could also reveal the origin of genetically-based disorders and differences in the human population. I mean, I think it gives uh, some new insight into the sort of genetic differences between human and chimp and, and what's different in terms of how our brains are being built. Uh, and I think it opens up maybe new ideas around uh, how humans have evolved and perhaps also in, in relation to certain brain disorders. Because maybe the same parts of the genome that's involved in human-specific mechanisms are also involved in human-specific diseases. It's very interesting to understand what made humans human. I mean, humans are, of course, very different in some aspects to all other animals. So to understand that, I think, is just for curiosity, very interesting. I think that's, that's the main driving force of our research. Then I think on the other hand, it might have implications to other things, right? As I said, to certain disease and for our understanding of, of the human population. But, but I think curiosity is the, is the most important driving force for us. Still to come on the Sunday 7, lab-grown coffee and how we plan to avoid an asteroid collision. Right after this. You're listening to the Sunday 7. Follow us for your weekday news espresso. Or even try our island edition. It's in all the usual places. What is this thing? It's an asteroid, sir. How it's like a come? scene from a disaster movie. NASA's latest mission plans to send a small spacecraft on a collision course with an asteroid. Asteroids have been hitting the Earth for billions of years. That's not new. What's exciting and new here is that we're actually taking the first steps to be able to prevent that potentially in the future. And that's where DART comes in. NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART for short, is a first-of-its-kind test for planetary defence. The mission's scheduled to launch in November, putting it on a collision course with an asteroid in September or October of next year. The idea is that when the spacecraft hits it, a small change in its orbit can be observed from Earth. It really is just a small nudge. The key behind this is uh, deflection, not disruption. We're absolutely not trying to disrupt this asteroid. We're just giving it a small nudge to change its future path. This asteroid's not on track to collide with Earth, but a small nudge like this could be enough to redirect a similar-sized asteroid from a collision course with the planet we call home. So DART is one part of NASA's larger planetary defense strategy. And it's not just all about deflecting asteroids. A really important part is finding all of the asteroids and tracking where they are. Worldwide, coffee is big business. It's one of the most popular plants in the world. It takes about three to four years to grow before producing berries that are then picked, washed, dried and roasted to make coffee. Globally, we consume about 500 billion cups of the stuff every year, and it's grown by farmers across Latin America, Africa and Asia. Coffee is a very sensitive plant and there's only so much suitable land where it'll grow. But as man-made climate changes warm the planet, that area is shrinking. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, but with high demand and climate change threatening traditional coffee farming, your morning cup of joe could be off the menu. However, researchers from the VTT Technical Research Center of Finland say they've successfully produced coffee cells in a lab that they say are on the way to tasting like the real thing. Helko Rishka leads the Finnish research team. We propose an alternative process here. We skip the farming part and we use uh, plant cell cultures instead. So actually real coffee cell cultures, but they are not uh, generated in the field, but instead we are growing them in bioreactors. The main idea with all these processes, basically using the cellular agriculture to substitute uh, agricultural commodities is of course to um, have a better sustainable uh, process. 
And there's not just one sustainability challenge when it comes to coffee. Not only are many farmers in the coffee growing belt experiencing the negative effects of climate change, high demand for coffee also means more lands required to produce enough beans, leading to more deforestation. Dr Aaron David, a botanist from Kew Gardens, spoke with Reuters and explained. So a decade ago we were talking about the impact of climate change, what it might mean, and now climate change is front and centre. For, for the coffee industry because we're seeing throughout the tropical coffee belt farmers being impacted by climate change, increased, increasing temperatures but also more erratic uh, rainfall and in increased drought. In VTT's process, cell cultures floating in the lab's bioreactors are used to create a variety of plant-based products including coffee. But does it pass the taste test? Not like, of course, 100%. It tastes a combination of different types of coffees, but of course we are not there yet with the, like, the commercial variety. But it certainly does resemble coffee at the moment. It's no surprise to you, but soil is a vital component of our ecosystem. It helps things grow, filters and cleans our water, regulates the atmosphere, and is fundamental for healthy food production of all types. However, according to the UN, a third of the world's top layer of soil is endangered. Dave Goulson, professor of biology at the University of Sussex, believes we need to make changes now to protect soil, understand more about how much we rely on it, and realise the impact it has on nature, our planet, and our health. Soil is something that we, we rather take for granted, you know, is it we often, we, it's often called dirt. We, we walk all over it, uh, we don't really think about it, but actually uh, it's, it's really vital stuff for our own survival. 95% of all... The, the, the food we grow in the world, all the food we eat, depends directly upon soil. Uh, so we wouldn't have, uh, you know, uh, veg fruits and vegetables and cereals and so on. Uh, we wouldn't have milk and yogurt without grass for the cows to eat, which all grows in soil. One issue that is really little appreciated is the vital importance of soil in the battle against climate change. Healthy soil is an incredible store of carbon, um, but if we damage it, then that carbon is released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. If we look after soil, it can help to, to lock up more and more carbon over time as the soil becomes healthier and richer in organic matter. So soil is actually potentially one of our most valuable, powerful tools in the battle against climate change. The bad news is our soil is damaged. We've exhausted our soils by, uh, largely by intensive farming over the last century. And when you plough soil, um, you, you break up and damage the soil structure, you kill some of the soil organisms, you expose it, the soil to the air, and some of it oxidises and goes into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And most critically, you leave it very vulnerable to, to rapid erosion by wind or rain. So what can we do to help the quality of our soil? Well, there are a number of things that individuals can do. Um, you can support organic farming. Um, there's clear scientific evidence that on average organic farms have healthier, richer soils with more carbon stored in them than con conventionally farmed fields, so that helps. If you're lucky enough to have a garden of your own, then there's, there's loads of stuff you can do to increase the quality of your own soil and do your bit. And that might not seem significant, but there are 22 million private gardens in the UK, so if they were all doing this, it would help. So. Uh, compost, that's the first stage in having a healthy soil, is make sure you recycle all your organic matter, make lovely compost and then spread it on your flower beds or your vegetable beds or whatever. And don't use pesticides in your garden. Many pesticides are really damaging to the soil and they can accumulate in soil over time. Uh, so if you can avoid that, then your own soil um, can over time lock up more and more carbon and become healthier and healthier. This has been The Sunday 7. Wherever you're listening, do us a favour and hit the follow button. We'll be back tomorrow at 7am with the regular Smart 7. Have a great rest of your weekend.